I can be a musician. I can release a performance, whether it's an audio, just an audio performance or an audio visual performance. I can say that there's only a hundred of these recordings in the world, right? That are cryptographically stamped. And these are my recordings. There's only a hundred of them. And I can sell that. And then those can be resold over and over again through the perception of a, through the collector mindset and the collector mentality. Mm -hmm. And I am generating revenue for myself every time that changes hands. And that's, that's amazing. In this episode of Building the Metaverse, John Radoff sits down with Lucas Wilson, the founder and CEO of Supersphere, a full stack VR rights technology and delivery company. They focus on connecting fans with the things they love through the medium of immersive entertainment. And some of their recent projects include live VR broadcasts with Billie Eilish, Post Malone, and Kid Cudi. Let's jump into this fireside chat. All right, Lucas, thanks for joining me on Building the Metaverse. This is really exciting because music is one of my favorite things. I know it's probably your favorite thing. And I think there are so many interesting things that we can talk about with respect to music. So I'm just going to give a quick preview of some of the stuff for people that are just sitting down and watching this video. You're going to learn a lot through this. And there's a, a little bit of something for everything, everyone here, because we're going to talk about the NFTs around music and what's happening in that scene and some of the crazy stuff like Bored Apes and Grimes are doing with NFTs and AI. We can talk about the live music experience and how that's going to evolve. We can talk about VR, which is a real specialty of, of what Lucas has been working on with respect to music. We can talk about AI around music composition. We can talk about the experiential aspect of what it might be like to actually visit concerts in the future, as well as some of the things that people have already done. Music is going to be an absolutely massive part of this thing we, we call the metaverse. So, you know, stick with us here. We're going to cover all of that and probably a bunch of things that, that Lucas will bring in that, that I didn't think of. So Lucas, you know, the reason I asked you to be here, other than that, I've gotten to know you on Clubhouse over the last few months and, and just really enjoy all the things you, you add to our conversations about music and otherwise, by the way, VR, AI, metaverse, NFTs. Um, so a few weeks ago, I had a conversation with Raf Koster, who's a, a brilliant MMORPG pioneer, virtual worlds guy. And we talked about the subject of music and he brought up this idea of, you know, maybe the metaverse is this continuum of like pay-per-view and, and we kind of have music in the metaverse already. I'm, I'm not doing his words justice. We talked about that a little bit more recently and, and you made something that I thought was just a great observation. What did you say? You said something about the, the conversation between the performer and the audience. And you really drew a distinction between that live experience and like pay-per-view or watching a movie. What, bring me back to sure. that because I'd love to start there. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for, thanks for having me on in this, in this conversation. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Clubhouse as well. There are apps that come and go and there are networks that come and go. And Clubhouse has been one of those rare moments where an app has come that has genuinely changed um, how I interact and how I meet people and how I deal with people. It's been it's been really wonderful. So I, I have also I have also deeply enjoyed uh, the chats and the in the communities that you've set up. So I've, I've I, I love it. So the um, going back to that conversation, I've been. I've been playing classical piano since I was five years old, right? Music, music and technology have always been the two greatest loves in my life. Um, and the, and as I got older, um, you know, as I got older, I, I got into synthesizers and I, I actually have a degree in music synthesis, which arguably I would put it up there pretty high as one of the more useless degrees on the planet. Um, you know, you don't get a lot of, you don't get a lot of jobs saying, uh, well, you went, you went to college. Yes, I okay for I you, have, Lucas. I'm, I don't think you... I have, I have a dual degree in music synthesis and music production and engineering and everybody goes, okay. Um, anyway, the, uh, so, the, uh, so, you know, but music has always been, music is fundamentally in, in culture and society 
in, in through, through the ages, music is fundamentally a conversation. Um, it is, it is a social, it's a social conversation of, of someone who has an idea to express that they don't express in language, that they express in some other way. And the response between that expression and the audience who's consuming that, who's consuming that expression. And the, and anything I keep my eye as I, as I sort of constantly scan the horizon for new and cool technology, I keep my eye on anything that can increase the, that can increase the connection between a performer and the audience or between a fan and, and, and the, and the thing that they love. Right. Um, and the, when virtual reality sort of made its second, when, when it had its second renaissance, you know, six, five, six years ago when it first started, you know, I thought, hey, virtual reality has been around for a long time. Um, but this time, I think that all the pieces are in place that it actually has a chance to hit uh, the consumer electro the consumer electronic curve the distribution curve, network speeds, all that sort of things, all these things sort of came together to create an environment in which in which something beyond just staring at your screen was able to happen. And and I'm not so much a virtual reality diehard as I am. I like VR. I mean, I've got a headset back here and I, I spend a lot of time in VR, but I'm, I'm much more interested in something that increases the connection between, in music especially, between a listener and the performer. Um, and that in the in the metaverse and the, all the different metaverse apps that are out there are revolutionizing how the how a performer and how an audience interact and how they gain something from each other. I think that was a very long answer to a short question, but I think I, I think I might have covered it. Yeah, I, I I think the key there is is that conversation that's happening between the artist and the audience, and that is a much different experience than listening to a recording watching a video of a concert which are which are perfectly great experiences it's nothing to take away from like the artistry that goes into a recording for example but this is a different kind of experience that happens in a live environment and and that i think is really interesting to think about with respect to the metaverse because to me the metaverse is this next generation of the internet which is really geared towards that live interaction, live activities that we're doing. It's the real-time nature of it that I think defines a lot of these new kinds of applications. And that we have to think about, like as we bring VR and virtual worlds and AR and things like that into it, it's not just being injected into a world and getting to explore it or adding information even to our world, kind of the purpose of AR, it's the interactive aspect. It's the fact that it's live. And, and that to me is sort of interesting. So. Like, let's maybe bookmark that thought for a moment. We can talk about some of the stuff that's already happened. So if you're watching this and you're you're learning about music in the metaverse for the first time, we should talk about the scale of some of what's happened already. And it's not sure. necessarily what we were just talking about. I want to talk, go back to the future in a moment. But like, if we look at some of these concerts in Fortnite and Roblox, like we're talking, you know, 40 million plus people. Yes, that's a lot of people. You know, so, Roblox, the the major metaverse apps right now, I would say, are probably Roblox, Minecraft, VR Chat, um, Horizon, and Rec Room. Those are those are those are probably the big ones right now. And each one of them has their own ecosystem. And each one of them is making their own moves in how in how music plays in those ecosystems. And one question I one question I get a lot, and I'm sure you get it all the time, is especially now, is what is the metaverse? What defines a metaverse? And, and all, all the all, beyond all the hype, what de, what defines this new kind of experience? Um, and I think this is global, but it's, this is especially important in music. Is that on on if you haven't already read it, go to MatthewBall.vc and, and take a minute, take you know, an hour or two and read his Metaverse Primer. It's a nine part series. That's an extraordinary explanation of, of the Metaverse that people should read if they're if they're interested in it. That and Tony Parisi's Seven Steps of the Metaverse, both wonderful things. But the um, but in Matthew Ball's um, article in his in his series of papers, he talks about he draws a very clear line of web you know web 1.0 um was was the first iteration of the web is desktop based 
you were sitting somewhere and you were looking at data and you were at, you were accessing connectivity by sitting here on a computer. Web 2.0 uh, or the next generation of, of the internet was mobile. Next generation of the internet was that you were able to take your data with you and be able to access it anywhere you anywhere you were. And then you also added location-based experiences to your data. So your data was able to be geotagged and, you're, and you were able to interact in a meaningful way based upon your position in space and time. Um, and Web3, which is really the, and Web3 is uh, the third generation of the internet as opposed to Web3, which means a different thing, is that now you're not just looking at data, you are in the data. You are, you are, you are now, you now have a physical presence in the internet and your physical presence interacts with data and interacts with other people around you that have a physical presence. So to me, what distinguishes metaverse apps and what distinguishes metaverse platforms is the fact that you have an avatar of some kind and you have a physical incarnation of some kind that is interacting with other people that are in that world. And then all of you are collectively as a social group, listening to experience, listening to music, and starting to have that same conversation between the performer and the audience that's so crucial to the music experience and to the live music experience. Um, so the, you know, and Roblox, um, and all of these, all of these metaverse apps are walled gardens right now, but that's okay. Uh, for me, it is, for me, it feels like we're in the Lumiere brothers days of the metaverse. It's, it's like you're, it's like you're in Paris in the 1900s and you, you're walking down the sidewalk and there's a, there's a metal, there's a metal canister there with slits in it and you, and you, you know, you, <laughs> You, you, you spin it around and you look in and there's a moving picture and you're, you're amazed at this new technology, right? That's where we are right now with the metaverse. And it's very, it's very analogous to the early days of the modern internet where you had you know, Xerox Park and USC and you had, you had all these islands of, of knowledge. And before really DNS and TCP IP and HTTP, before its standards emerged to connect those areas of knowledge, you have these islands. And that's where we are right now, right? Roblox, Horizon, Rec Room, VRChat, there are all these islands of communities. And the next big thing that'll happen is that you're gonna to start to connect these islands. The HTTP and TCP IP of the metaverse will start to emerge and these islands will start to connect. And that will be, I think, an incredibly explosive moment for anybody who enjoys the metaverse and also for for my particular selfish interest for music and for music experiences and for music communication in the metaverse. Once again, I think I've answered a short question with a very long answer. Well, I mean, I think that's really helpful because, you know, this may be the first time that people are even coming across this concept. They've heard about metaverse. They're wondering what the hype is. And there is this future that's sitting out there where we interact with each other in real time. There's a social aspect to it. Music, of course, is social, right? So you just hit on a really important aspect of it, which is that conversation between the artist and the audience, but also the fact that there's that community that's there and they are present with each other as well. Because I think for any of us who've been to concerts, like we know the power of that experience, the, the power of being part of a whole group of people who are experiencing things at the same time, you know, as a community, and then also with my local group of friends, my social sphere. The interesting thing about the, the social interaction in metaverse apps right now is that, and I encourage everybody, I, I encourage everybody that if you're looking at the metaverse apps right now and you're seeing all these little, these funky looking, very primitive looking avatars, and you're like, that's silly, I'm not gonna do that. I, I'd encourage you to get over that and to try it because I'm a I'm a 51 year old guy, right? I'm a 51 year old white guy. There's, uh, why would I be screwing around with a headset and in, in, in little avatars in a social app? That sounds like something that's for kids, right? And it is. It's for kids. Um, but the the interesting thing, I had a big aha moment when uh, when we first started working with uh, Facebook. Now Meta, my company does does a lot of work with Facebook. Uh, meta. I'm still changing that chip in my brain. <laughs> it's all the same. That's fine. I'm trying. I'm trying to be respectful of the company wanting to change its name, but I've been calling it Facebook for a long time. It'll take a while. Um, so, when venues, which is Facebook's uh, metaverse platform for live experiences, 
and we've done a lot of work in venues. When, when venues first launched a couple of years ago, and we went into, when I first looked at the platform and I was seeing the screenshots before it really launched, um, I was like, well, that's goofy. Why, why the hell would anybody do that? I was like, but hey, it's a gig, it's a good opportunity. Let's <laughs> march down, let's march down the road and see what happens, right? And the first time I put on a headset and went into venues and joined other people in venues and joined other people watching, uh, watching something. And at that time it was, we were still in beta um, we had not launched the first music show in venues yet. We, Supersphere, the, our company, did the, did the very first music show in venues, um, Vance Joy, a couple of years ago. And we were watching test streams with, with people internally at Facebook. And I had the aha moment of, oh, this is a social experience, right? This has, this has no, the avatars are, are secondary. The, the, and the avatars will, the technology for avatar creation will continue to grow and that'll continue to evolve and that'll be fine. This is a social experience. And, and, that, and, and that, of course, made sense and resonated immediately with, ah, okay, Facebook, of course it's a social experience. Um, and then when we first started doing shows and we first started streaming into metaverse platforms and we've streamed into, into several now, if you are, if you, A, if you have a headset, um, if you have a quest, right? If you have one of these and you are going into a specific app at a specific time to see a specific band, you're a super fan. Um, <laughs> you're like, you're, you just are, right? You're, you're a super fan. You have, you are in an elite qualification of fan for that experience. Whether you're a fan of the technology or whether you're a fan of the artist or both, you're a super fan. And if you're a super fan, you're psyched to be there. And it's, it's the weirdest thing, but it mm -hmm. makes sense that it, as a social psychology standpoint, when you step into that audience and everybody's there waiting for the show to come on, you have that same, you get that same sort of personal response. You get that same sort of feeling when you go into a live venue and, and everybody's there and kind of buzzing and waiting for the lights to go down and waiting for the band to come on. Obviously you don't have, you don't have the smells, you don't have the same sort of electricity in some ways that you do in a, in a live show, but you, you recapture a lot of that excitement, a lot of that feeling. And when the lights go down and the band comes on, all the avatars throw up their hands and it's, and it's at, at the same time, it's silly and it's exciting because you see people jumping up and down, you hear the voices of people singing and you find yourself caught up in the experience. You find yourself doing the same things and it's awesome. It's, 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 it's music and it's experiencing music in a way that people haven't experienced it before. And it's connecting fans in a new way. And it's also opening up the avenue. It's opening up avenues to see and experience music to people who, for whatever reason, can't get to the live venue. Either they don't live in the same city or they have a disability, which prevents them from, from going to the, physically mm -hmm. going to a live venue, or they have a disability in which whether it's neurodiversity or they have a disability that that the social component of being in all people and processing all those different emotions simultaneously is too hard and too overwhelming. It opens up a world for people for other people to experience live music. And it's that for me is incredibly exciting. Yeah, it opens it up to a lot more people and it also lets us rethink the whole live experience too in, a, in what I think would be a more abundant fashion something i've mentioned before is just sort of like the reality that a concert venue is a piece of real estate so you're stuck with the realities of three-dimensional physical space that we're in in the metaverse you actually can rethink that all over again it, it doesn't have to be front row seats as rival goods to each other in fact you could even integrate the audience into the musical experience you could have them on the stage like it, really you do it any way you want like I, it seems like something people can experiment with quite extensively and it's not going to to just be limited to the kind of a, a like the vr version of the concert experience that some of us are already familiar with I, i'm curious though like how are you work with some of the most amazing artists in the world like you should talk a little bit about that, but particularly I'm curious, like what are the artists telling you? How are they approaching this as a new form of bringing their music to their audience? Sure. 
Yeah, and as you've met, as you mentioned, we've worked with we've done more than 200 shows over the past several over the past several years, and we've worked with everybody from emerging artists in small venues to sold out arenas with um, Billie Eilish, Post Malone, Offset, Young Thug, Kid Cudi, and a, a Paul McCartney, and a, a sort of a, a list of, of music um, some of those. Uh, legends. Yeah, some of those. <laughs> and in general, there are there are just like there is in society. I mean, there's a there's a segment of musicians that are geeks, and I think the the, the Venn diagram of geeks and musicians is is pretty large. Um, so a lot of musicians, a lot of musicians that we deal with um, are already very familiar with VR. A lot of them already have headsets. A lot of them are already doing stuff, right? Um, you know, we worked with uh, we worked with Young Thug about um, about a year ago, and that dude is a he's a hardcore geek. He um, he is he was and he's and he's he's friggin' sharp. I mean, we showed him we he was new to VR at the time, but we showed him um, we showed him a head we gave him a headset we showed him a headset and showed him like a couple of ideas. And then he was like, I got this. Y'all step away, I got this. And we we're like, okay. And uh, and sure enough, 24 or 48 hours later, he came up with an experience that we never would have thought of. And we were like, mm -hmm. well, that's why you're, that's why you're a highly paid art. That's why you're a highly paid professional artist and I'm not, right? Um, it was, so the artists in general, um, if they're not familiar with it, we typically give artists a headset that we work with because we want them to be familiar with the experience. Um, and the, and once they see it to, to, and I can, I can say this, I can say this honestly, that every single artist that we've worked with, once they see it, and once we show them the work that we do, they're like, I get it. Okay, cool. And then they want to get into it. And then they want to figure out, okay, how do I connect to people in this new way? Because for them, it expands the audience, right? They, they fundamentally got into the music industry because they want to communicate. They want to, they want to spread their art and their music to an audience. And they, and this is a new way of communicating. And some of them, some of them go deep. And so in general, artists and musicians love it. They just see it as a new way of, as a new way to communicate and a new way to reach out to fans. Um, some of them are, there are some artists that have a very antagonistic stand to, um, anything that's not a live in-person communication. Um, you know, father John Misty pretty famously calls out, uh, Oculus in, in one of his, in one of his songs. Um, and you know, there, there are some artists that, that really don't like the aspect of separation. Um, but in general, I'd say that's a very that's a very niche group of artists. So when we talk about separation, let's, let's talk about that for a moment, because I think some people envision a future where people could even play music together, right? Like who are coming in to the metaverse from lots of remote locations. There, there's some hard tech problems with that, right? There are, I mean, the, um, you, uh, un until somebody, until somebody comes out, comes out and wins a new Nobel prize, uh, you can't get around the speed of light. Um, late, you know, late latency, latency and lag are our network issues wherever you go in whatever platform you're on, whatever you're doing. It's eventually going down the same wires. Um, and we've we've dealt quite a bit, pretty extensively with um, with performance and with audience audience and performer interaction. Um, in dealing pretty deep with latency and lag issues. And there's only, honestly, there's only so much you can do. At a certain point, you have your, you can get it down to, you know, a second or two, a second or two of latency, uh, maybe less um, if you're on a very specialized platform on dark fiber. You can get down to very minimal latency, but doing synchronized performance um, across, the, across the internet is, is very hard. Um, if you're doing true live synchronized performance, it's very hard. Um, and it requires a, a pretty skilled set of musicians that can, that can almost ignore the lag and, and keep playing. Because even in, if you're using uh, Jamulas, Jam Kazam, there's, there's a couple of different platforms out there for, for doing it. Um, you're always going to get a tiny bit of lag and it requires you, it, it's really very, very simple. Anybody can test it on Zoom, on Google or whatever. All you have to do is is say, okay, count with me. One, two, three, four, one, and and have the other person join in, and you'll very quickly discover how big the lag is on your system. 
Um, mm -hmm. And it requires musicians to keep playing. If they're going to do a synchronized performance, it requires them to mentally keep playing and not slow down because they're listening to they're listening to what happened a beat or two ago, which is which can be done, but it's very difficult. Um, in the sort of as a as a complete tangent, in the classical music world, um, uh, church organists um, are are masters of of that particular kind of playing, and mm -hmm. it's in. It, next time, if you ever go see an organ concert, think about this. When a church organist hits a key. There's a mechanical and electrical apparatus that has to that has to that has to that has to power a wind column to then go up a pipe to make a note. That process of hitting that key to hearing the note from the wind column can sometimes take up to a quarter second. Um, and if you're playing like a fast Bach piece or you're playing a fast Baroque piece, which is which is there's a ton of Baroque music for the organ. A church organist or a classical organist is playing usually a measure ahead of what they're hearing. And it's it's I, I've sat down at a couple of church organs and tried to do that. And it, it is extraordinarily difficult because you have to completely separate what your fingers are doing from what you're hearing. The performance has to be in your brain and you mm. can't pay attention to what you're listening to. It's it's extraordinary. But the but the same sort of thing exists in doing a synchronized performance. And if and that same sort of thing, that same sort of challenge exists when you're dealing with the interaction between the performer and the audience, because there's always going right. to be a little bit of a lag. Um, and if, if the lag I'm is small, like enough, head, head, I'm going to want a head bang, and it's really me. But it sounds like it's going to need to be an AI that syncs that animation for me. Well, one thing that the interesting thing is that as long as the audience is listening to a synchronized experience then then the audience can all headbang and bop and do stuff in unison right and the data that needs to be transmitted to to see your 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 um, mates your your people in the in the space doing actions and motions your brain is much more forgiving of that lag um than than the lag than a lag in sort of live performance and live listening if the lag is low enough, then you can have a genuine interaction between the performer and the audience. You know, hello, Cleveland, what's up? If there's a second or two of delay, you know, between a performer saying that and the audience going, woo, that's okay. Um, 30 to 40 to 50 seconds of lag and delay, which is typical in, in, a, in, a, in a produced live broadcast, not as acceptable. Okay, so it, it sounds like we have a little bit of latitude with audience kind of engagement around the live interaction between the audience and the performer. Um, maybe there will be some ultra skilled performers like church organists. I, I, it never even occurred to me and it makes complete sense now that I understand it. And I'm thinking through the whole electromechanical process of just how organs work. So maybe we'll have some people that specialize in, in being able to do that. But it sounds like jam sessions. Where I just meet people in a, in a random location, that's gonna that's gonna take a while, or maybe be now, an AI application. Well, there is, but there are there are companies that are that are coming up with clever ways of enabling enabling live performance without without relying on exact live interaction. There's a company called Endless, which is Endless with three S's at the end. Endless.fm um, has a really cool uh, program that's available on on iOS and it's available on mobile and on desktop that is based on people listening to loops. Um, people listening to a they're listening to an ongoing stream and it's looped and you have you have a loop that you can you can interact and play with the loop locally and then you can publish it. Um, to the master sequence that everybody's listening to, so you can still you can still interact as a as a musician and play locally and jam and come up with something that you like and then publish it into the stream where everybody else then listens to it the next wow. time around yeah. and then they yeah. can they can download that and interact with it right so it's it's a very clever way of of getting um, of still feeling like you're part of a live jam experience while um, getting around the the latency and lag issues that you really can't get around because it's a it's just a speed of light thing yeah no that's really cool though because that just suggests like there's going to be a lot of creativity around this there's going to be new ways of interacting live where you can be a music creator and there will be a live aspect to it but maybe not exactly what we're used to from 
from all aspects of, of the real world. Yeah, and you mentioned and you mentioned AI and and you know uh, the, some of the tools that are coming out in terms of in terms of how you deal with um, audio analysis and how you translate that into various other segments of data that can that can enable a live performance. And I think you're going to see a lot of companies and, and a lot of creativity come up around that. I mean, if you're playing, you know, a, a very simple example is that if a piece of music is playing and it's at 115 beats per minute, well, if it's at 115 BPM, then you can uh, there can be a system that can that can understand that can listen to that analyze the the BPM, understand what kind of music it is, and then can actually sort of prime the audience mechanics to respond to that kind of music. So maybe you have, maybe you're doing your own individual dancing or what have you, but all the avatars are sort of pulsing and moving at a baseline to that, to that certain beat that is the music. So you still get the, you get a feeling of sync, of synchronous behavior while still having an individual layer on top of it. Right. And that's just one example off the top of my head. There's a million others and a lot of smart people thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. So we've covered like some of the VR aspects of this, the concert experience, some of these new forms of creativity. Let's return back to the artists for a moment because there's some other stuff that isn't exactly music, but it's around music happening with like blockchain and AI, like just recently, like two stories that spring to mind, like, I guess Grimes is going to be converting herself to an AI over time. She's, she's going to have an AI girl band or something. I'm, uh, and then the, the craziest thing I saw recently, crazy, I think in, in kind of a really interesting way is, is, uh, yeah, the, uh, apes were just signed to like form a band. It was universal Keisha. music group. Yeah, kingship, exactly. So like NFTs of uh board apes. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> Bingo. So you you were the first person to say NFT. I was waiting for that. Yeah, uh, there we go. All right. We we don't shy uh, away from NFTs on this series. <laughs> no, it's you know <laughs> why the, should people care about NFTs with respect to music and what is all this stuff that's going on with like board apes? All right. <laughs> okay. Deep breath. Sip of tea. <laughs> okay. So as, and I'm sure you experienced the same thing as, as a, as a founder, right? Um, whenever any big wave of new technology hits your landscape, right? Whenever it enters into the fringes or smacks you in the face at, you can, at a personal level, you can be like, oh, cool, shiny new object. Let's go play. Right. At a, at a professional level, you have to you have to sort of look at that wave of technology and and try to understand what parts of it you need to pay attention to and what parts of it you need to incorporate into what you're doing and what parts of it you you need to ignore because it's not core to what you do and what parts of it are just annoying, shiny objects. Right. And with blockchains and NFT, with block with the blockchain world and the NFT world, I went through that same personal process over the past year or so of, of looking at it and diving into it and understanding what what blockchains what what value blockchain technology can bring to what we do and then what value um, nfts on top of that can bring to what we do and you know i came to the the block the advantages for for blockchain based distribution um, and blockchain involvement in the music industry is is huge um, there's there's no shortage. That's an entire other um, hour long discussion. Uh, we did our first blockchain streamed concert uh, with NFT drops on the Alluvio platform last week with the band Angels and Airwaves, uh, Tom Belong and Angels and Airwaves, and it was fantastic. It was fantastic. The Alluvio platform actually is is a, a wonderful tool in that it is the streaming quality is is extraordinary, um, and the way that they've integrated uh, NFT experiences into a blockchain based stream and enabled an audience to participate is, is really nice. It's one of the first one of the first solid professional attempts I've seen at that in the industry. Um, but the reason why NFTs matter um, to the music industry is because, first of all, you have to uh, I'll spend I'll try to spend just a couple of minutes on this and, and, and raise your hand and stop me if Go I'm going it. too far into Go the weeds. It. Okay. 
Um, so NFTs are are essentially I'll do I'll do a tiny bit of explanation before I go into music for people that are listening and, and are interested. NFTs are essentially for right now think of them they do a lot of other things but think of them at a starting level as a collector economy. Think of them as the phrase digital baseball cards has been thrown out a lot and there there is some truth to that in that it's the psychology of the collector. If you've ever been a collector of anything, stamps, coins, ticket stubs, matchboxes, cars, whatever, it doesn't matter. If you've ever had a collector's mindset then, then you understand um, scarcity, and you understand rarity, and you understand going after certain things in your specific bubble of collect of collection, and you understand why that's valuable to you and why that's valuable to other people in your community. That's the collector's psychology and mindset. Something that may be worth um, $900,000 to you just, and to your community, and you may be able to sell it for $900,000, the world at large may look at that and go, why would I pay $5 for that? doesn't matter because it's it, it has value within your community that has existed for forever in the in the physical world and in the phys in physical marketplaces right cars uh, knives uh, I'm thinking of stuff that, that I like cars yeah. knives well, synthes we've got the proto synthes synthesizer synthesizers the cameras right so that's the whole so, proto nft with Wu-Tang clan right right the Martin so, Shrelly collectible I guess he had to sell it off now but uh, mm -hmm. So that, By the so way, in that, NFTs, we'll, we'll put something in, up in the corner because I had a talk with James Zhang recently, who's got a whole company built around like digital art concept, and covered NFTs. concept art house. Good, so we'll, pe good we'll, people. Yeah, we'll throw a link up in that so you can go check out that as well if you want a deep background in NFTs. We covered a lot of that so, stuff. But sorry, cut you cool. off. In so, your discussion I'm sorry, and, I, and I, won't go too much, I won't go too much further into it. So the thing is, is that once you understand the collector mindset, then the thing that I needed, that I personally needed to wait for and need to convince myself of was, okay, an NFT, that's physical collection and physical scarcity. In the culture at large, in the cultural zeitgeist at large, does the concept of digital scarcity have value? Do people care about digital scarcity? Um, if I say that, if I say that I have a, a cryptographically secure one of one piece, right? And it only exists in the digital realm. Does the culture attach value to that? Do people attach value to that the same way that they do a physical, a physical artwork? If I have a board ape, if I have a one of one board ape, does that have the same value to me and to other people as a canvas with, a, with paintings of flowers from an old Dutch, uh, an old dead Dutch guy, right? Um, and, and so the, and so I was waiting and the answer, at least in this initial stage of the hype curve of NFTs is, is a resounding yes, right? It's, and the board apes are a great example of that. You may think that you may think that the board apes are silly. You may think, why would anybody want to buy some? Why would anybody buy something like that? Think whatever you want. But the point is, is that it has reached a cultural milestone that it is a collectible and people value it as a collectible and people want it, right? Post Malone, Steve Aoki, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy Fallon. I mean, one of the, I've forgotten which Kardashian, but one of the Kardashians, right? <laughs> the, the, there's, there's the cultural touchstones are now all buying board apes and have created this aura of collectivity and scarcity around them that people now want them and, and it matters. And I was, and once you see that start to happen, then you're like, okay, that matters. Great. So NFTs. So you've gone from the collector mindset to crossing the line to being a digital collector and having that matter. Why does it then now matter to the music industry? Um, a couple of things is that number one. Now think about that as once you have the background of a physical collector and a digital collector. Now apply that to music merchandise. Apply that to digital merch and music merchandise. I mean, like, like um, just as a Except digital yeah. version. This isn't like a, this isn't like a digital a, hologram. I'm actually no. wearing. Like like your like your Zep like your Zep T-shirt, or I'm gonna I'm gonna reach over here. Hold on, I'm gonna step out of frame for a minute, and I'm gonna reach <laughs> over here and pull out my one of my favorite things is my I got this a uh, couple of months ago, 180 180 gram pressing of run of RTJ four, run the jewels four, right? There okay. aren't that many of these there aren't that many of these albums, and this matters to me, right? Yeah. If I had a cryptographically secure digital version of that then that matters to me. I'm a collector, right? So digital merchandise, number one, is a huge avenue. 
Number two, the, the, I think the most revolutionary thing for the music industry is the concept of the smart contract and how NFTs are built into smart contracts. Because traditionally for artists, um, I have a thing, I sell the thing and that's it. Then I sell the thing and I lose track of it and I no longer have any hold of that. And I no longer have any way to track that and I no longer have any way to make money from that. I no longer have any way to support a livelihood from that. The concept of the smart contract for the, for the first time ever that I can think of, creates the concept of passive revenue generation and generational wealth for musicians and for artists. I can, if it is up to me to create a community for my, the, the dynamics of creating a community and being an artist have not changed, right? I still have to generate something of value and I still have to convince people um, through my artwork and through my music that it is valuable and that they want it. And I still have to build a community of people that want my thing, right? And want to listen to my thing. But once I've done that, then I can release something that has value. People can buy it. And the way a smart contract works is that the, I, I receive money from that initial transaction, but I can put a piece into the smart contract that says every time that this is resold anywhere, I receive a small percentage of that secondary tertiary and tertiary transaction forever. As that thing winds its way through blockchains and through the internet, I am making money from that from that piece of content. And now, if you think about an artist that is a professional artist or professional musician that's constantly generating content, constantly generating community, constantly building that community, and everything they put out there is blockchain based and NFT based, then you are creating a wealth of content that has a passive revenue generation stream for musicians and artists, and that is extraordinary. Um, and right, being because it's to, not recording anymore, right? It is the performance and other than certain artists, like recording has really decreased as a source of revenue for a lot of these artists. Right. And I can be a, mu I can be a musician. I can release a performance, whether it's an audio, just an audio performance or an audio visual performance. I can say that there's only a hundred of these recordings in the world, right? That are cryptographically stamped. And these are my recordings. There's only a hundred of them and I can sell that. And then those can be resold over and over again through the perception of a through the collector mindset and the collector mentality. Mm -hmm. And I am generating revenue for myself every time that changes hands. And that's, that's amazing. I mean, you know, if I have, it's the equivalent of, I have this album I paid, I forgot how much I paid for this album. It kind of doesn't matter to me because I'm a fan and I wanted it. And <laughs> however, much it was, I, however much it was, I had enough money in my bank account and I paid for it. Right. Um, and, but now, I can take this. If I no longer want it, I can take it and go sell it. I can take it to a record store and go sell it. Run the jewels. Run the jewels doesn't make any money from this. If I sell it, if this is an NFT and I sell it because I don't want it anymore, run the jewels continues to make money from it. And that's, that's a big deal. Yeah. So we, we just looked at it through the, through the lens of the artist and also kind of the collector. There, there's other reasons that like, a shirt like this, for example, is valuable to someone. So as I think through it, like I'm thinking back to when I got it. So fortunately, I'm not quite old enough to have been to a Led Zeppelin con concert, but I went to the Rock and Roll um, Museum in Seattle and they had the shirts there and I was like, OK, I want to get this shirt for a couple of reasons. One is I'm a fan. And when I wear this shirt, I want to be identified as a Zeppelin fan. And, and that'll be a great conversation starter with people. And it's, it's about personal expression, I think. And then another aspect is the story of it. Like, as I wear this shirt, I'm remembering the time I visited the museum and the stuff that I did there and, and the fun that I had and the group that I was with. So I think oh, an additional tool that, that some of you watching might want to bring into your, you know, tool chest of the metaverse about how to approach these things is also just how valuable personal expression has become through our digital presentation over the last couple of decades. Games and online world social networks, I think that's trained all of us to try to ensconce ourselves in a bunch of things that say things about who we are, what we're interested in, and what could be more powerful than going to the virtual merch table at the concert that you actually attended in the metaverse and then you walk away with something that's interoperable and you wear you know t-shirt is kind of an example but there will be way more creative like versions of this like you could get tattooed with it like you could have an animation like this is going to be well, some cool stuff that reflects on my like personal expression 
And another thing that I think um, that professionals in this space, that adult professionals in this space need to keep in mind is that there's a huge generational mindset shift as well in terms of, in terms of digi analog creation, digital creation, analog worth and digital worth. Um, I grew up, you know, I, I, I grew up when I was, when I was a teenager and I was, when I was in college, um, I grew up in an analog world, right? The internet was just starting to hit when I was in, when I was in college and mobile phones were just starting to be a tool for the wealthy. Um, when I was, when I was in college, right? That's, that's my formative, that's my formative experience. My formative experience in terms of being a fan and being a collector is analog. My kids formative experience in being a fan and being a collector is digital. And for them, the, the worth of something digital and the worth of something analog, depending on the asset, depending on what they have, it's, it's fungible. Um, it's, it, 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 it goes back and forth. I have a story that I've told a couple of times that I love as an illustrative example. We did a, um, we did a show with Billie Eilish and, you know, I, I, one of my friend's daughters is, is, uh, in the running, it's stiff competition, but she's in the running for biggest Billie Eilish, world's biggest Billie Eilish fan, right? Stiff competition, <laughs> she's in the, but she's in the running, right? And I made sure that, you know, I told my buddy and made sure that, that she was in the show and, and got to see the, it was a virtual reality broadcast, made sure she got to see the show. And she was, um, she was, and my buddy told me this uh, the next day and it was, he and I talked about it for a while. She was the cool kid at school the next day because she went and saw a Billie Eilish show in VR. And in her brain, the first show that she went to see was Billie Eilish. Um, mm -hmm. And kids came up to her and talked to her about the show and wanted to know about it. She was, everybody's had this experience of, of being mm -hmm. the cool kid or seeing the cool kid. You were right? in the concert. Yeah, you were at the show. Like, yeah, you exactly. were at the show. She at the school the next day. She was at the show, and she was the cool kid, right? And I was like, "Well, how about that?" And that's a generational shift. That's a huge generational shift and generational mindset shift. So everybody that's that's that has any kind of gray in their in their hair needs to think about that. Needs to think about how you approach digital and how your kids approach digital, how the next generation will approach digital. When you think about NFTs, when you think about blockchain, when you think about digital collectibles, you may look at the board, you may look at, look at the board apes and go, are you fucking kidding me? Uh, why am I gonna pay? I'm gonna pay what for that? Are you, are you high? <laughs> but, but your, but your kids are thinking differently about it in the generation not, ahead of you. Yeah, people who have that reaction, they're not understanding how important digital identity, digital expression, and, and also, as you were pointing out, digital experience. I actually don't like to talk about like real versus virtual. I, I like to talk about virtual versus physical because yeah, I think they're both the... equally real from an experience, from, from a relationship standpoint and everything else. I almost, you know, it's funny. I've struggled with the wording for that. And, and the, because physical versus virtual doesn't work for me either because I am still having a physical experience. Right. Yeah. Um, and so the, the and, and this is imperfect, but I've, I've, I've cycled between lots of different ways of expressing that and in, in person versus remote, I think is, is the, is the closest I can come to it because that, that sort of communicates the fundamental of Am I having an experience where I am connected in the same physical location to to a performer or am I remote from the performer? And that to me is and then that's sort of the, the, the foundation. And then from there, I can build the technology of, OK, how am I experiencing this? Is this a YouTube stream, a VR stream? Am I what's going on? Right. So anyway, yeah. the um, but, you know, and also I would venture to say for everybody who's 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 an NFT a denier or NFT naysayer, I would I would venture to say, think about this. Everybody here that's watching this is already a digital collector. You just don't know it. Do you take pictures on your phone and share them? Do you do you share memes? Do you collect memes? Do you when you see something funny on the internet, you stick it in a folder and then do you have a friend group that like you're the person that is, that shares a specific type of meme and is known for sharing the funny things? You're a collector. You already are a digital collector and you already have things in your possession that have intrinsic digital value to you. This is just the next generation of that. Uh, that is awesome. And, and that's a great 
exclamation point on this whole talk. I, I, I hope that this has been really interesting to people. My advice on all of this metaverse stuff is that people just approach it with some humility, with some curiosity, with some imagination, because this is really a starting point. And there's a lot that we're going to be able to do with this when it's real time, socially connected, our identities are important, the way we express ourselves. And there's going to be whole new types of experiences. It's not just going to be a digital mirror all the time of something that we're already accustomed to. It'll be that, and then we'll take it to a whole new level with the abundance that the space offers, with AI, with, with all the stuff we've talked about. So really amazing stuff, Lucas, and want to thank you for, for being here. And, and by the way, we will put something down in the, in the show notes here so you can find Lucas's company and check out the work that they do, which is really awesome. You heard about some of the artists Lucas has been working with. So super special treat to, to have been able to spend the last hour or so with you talking about this stuff. What would you like everybody to know about music in the metaverse that, that hasn't been said or that you want to reinforce? Uh, my, my overall um, message is, is never stop being a learner. Um, never stop being a learner. Always try to always be humble. Humble may not even be the right word. Try to always recognize that there's a constant stream of new information coming at you um, and be a learner that you never know when, if you're a music fan, if you listen to music, a cool new experience is gonna hit you. Um, and try it a couple of, don't just try it once, try it a couple of times and see if, see what see what resonates from you. Take leave what you don't, but be a learner. Don't, don't, um, don't, don't never have the, never have the default reaction of of poo-pooing a technology just because it's new and just because the cool kids are using it um there might be something there for you excellent That's it. and, and yeah, john excellent. thanks thanks so much thanks so much for inviting me i i always as you can tell i like to talk and i always enjoy having having geek conversations with similar minded people yeah this has been a lot of fun so yeah everybody be a learner Go experience music in the metaverse and, and start imagining the way it's going to become over time as well. Music is going to be one of the most important things that we do in the metaverse because it's one of the most important things we do as human beings. And John and I are both on Clubhouse more than we should be. So if you want to come talk to us in person, join us on Clubhouse. Yeah, join us there. And by the way, subscribe down below and you'll keep seeing more conversations like this with thought leaders from the metaverse, from music, from art, from game design, from the technology side. We've got a lot planned and coming up. So glad you could be here and listen to this. And if you put through, uh, you know, the last hour or so of hearing me and Lucas talk, really grateful for your time because you can spend it a lot of ways on the internet, in the metaverse and everything else in your life. So with that, Thanks again, Lucas. This has been a hell of a lot of fun. Great conversation. And I hope everyone's inspired coming out of this. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.